Over the years, there have been many different models of the atom. Science is constantly changing and growing. As we learn more, we can define things better. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of the atom, and then we're going to talk about more detail about what we can find in an atom. This represents a timeline of how the model of an atom has changed over time. Back in 400 BC, it was thought that there was small particles. Then Aristotle decided that there was not those small particles. That stopped everything for about 2,000 years. Then again in, 18, in 1803, Dalton showed that there would be these small particles, but he also suggested that they could be joined together. Next, we found out that there were some electrons. Then we found out there was a nucleus. Then we figured out how those electrons flowed together in 1913. You'll notice that a lot of things were happening. Once we've got one little detail, more and more things will be learned. In 1926 and 27, we found out a lot more details about how those electrons orbit around the nucleus. What we're going to do in this unit we're going to look at how these atomic models were developed and then we're going to summarize a little bit more about the atom and tell you what you need to know for the test. Democritus was the first to come up with the idea of the atom. His idea was that all of matter was to, composed of tiny indivisible entities called atoms. You could break them down into no smaller pieces. Those atoms would have all of the properties of whatever element or thing we were looking at. For Democritus, he didn't really have a good argument for why he believed it. He just thought it was the truth. Because of this, his ideas were quickly rejected. He didn't have any good experimental evidence. About a hundred years later, Aristotle showed that all matter was composed of fire, wind, earth, and water. His idea was that if you have a piece of wood, when you burn it, it gave off fire. It had turned into air or smoke. The wood then turned into dust, which turned back into the earth and the wood was composed of the fire, the earth, and the air. He had proof of his idea. We now know that it was wrong, but he did have experimental scientific proof according to what they knew at the time. Interestingly, Aristotle was so well respected that everybody believed what he had to say and trusted his scientific ideas. This shows that sometimes science is wrong and yet everybody will believe what's happening. Just because you can make a model doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Some people will say that Aristotle actually sat back thinking about the way atoms work by 2,000 years. While Democritus was noted as the first person to identify atoms, when Aristotle came up with his idea and had more proof, more experimental evidence, his work was lost. About 2,000 years later, Dalton reopened the idea that Democritus had that matter was composed of tiny, indivisible entities that were also called atoms. What Dalton brought to the table was the fact that he could take those atoms and join them together in small ratios to make new chemicals. The main reason this theory was acceptable was because it added in the formation of compounds. Because we were able to make small compounds that followed the law of conservation, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions, and other observations, and Aristotle's could not answer these things, Dalton's atomic theory became acceptable. Once this new model was formed, there was a revolution in the idea of how atoms could be modeled. About a hundred years later, J.J. Thompson discovered that there were electrons. There were some particles that composed the atom, which previously was thought to be indivisible. These first subatomic particles were just thought to be spread throughout the whole atom. These negatively charged particles were thought to be swimming in a pool of positive charge. That model of the atom was called the plum pudding model, where the electrons look like little pits of plum inside of a pudding of positive charge. J.J. Thomson discovered the electrons by shooting something called a cathode ray, which is essentially some electrons, through a magnetic field. 
Those electrons were deflected one direction, which showed that there was some kind of charge on the particle. And that told them that there were electrons. Later on, he was able to find out the size of those electrons by how far they deflected. In less than 10 years, Ernest Rutherford found that there was actually a nucleus that had all that positive charge stored in it. Later, we found that those were called our protons. The electrons were thought to be going around the outside of the nucleus. And that was discovered by shooting a radioactive beam through a gold foil. It was noted that the vast majority of those radioactive particles passed right through, and only certain ones did not. Those ones were deflected by the nucleus. And that is how they discovered there was a nucleus. About 20 years later, Sir James Chadwick discovered that there were some uncharged particles called neutrons. The discovery of the neutron explained why the mass of the atom was, no, was not equal to the mass of the proton and the electrons. This answered many questions for people about what the atomic structure was. His experiment shot some radiation through some beryllium and some paraffin wax, which separated the neutrons and the protons, and we were able to determine the mass of those two particles. All of this gave us the basic structure of the atom, which included a nucleus that was composed of the protons and the neutrons surrounded by the electrons on the outside. Further studies looked at how those electrons were actually found in the atom. Focusing on just the electrons, we can see that the electrons started off as the first particle found in the atom, our first subatomic particles. Eventually, Ernest Rutherford found that those were orbiting around the nucleus because we found a nucleus, found that the electrons were outside of that. Later, Niels Bohr found that those electrons have energy levels. That was discovered by the release of light. Every element had a different color, and those colors depended upon the levels, what location the electrons were in. Those levels were called shells, and there are seven shells to match the seven shells that we find in the periodic table. On the periodic table, those shells are called periods. In this class, that is the last level that we will focus on. We're going to talk about the Bohr level. I will talk a little bit about the further levels, but just to give you some information. In the middle of the 1920s, Erwin Schrödinger discovered that by calculation, he could figure out where the electrons were most likely to be. We call those probabilities. And so we don't know exactly where the electrons are. We know the most likely places they will become. We'll notice that in all of the models, no electrons are found in the nucleus because the nucleus is filled with protons and neutrons. We can't have any electrons in that position. These levels are found within the levels that were found by Bohr. And so these are called sublevels, and we actually call them orbitals when we're discussing them in chemistry. You may have heard of Schrodinger's cat, which is an explanation of what we mean by probability. It ends up that a cat cannot be both dead and alive at the same time, just like we can't say exactly where the electron is, only where there's a probability or chance of those electrons being. And later, in the same decade, Werner Heisenberg theorized that we can't both know where the electrons are and where they're going at the same time. Either you know right where they are, or you know where they're headed, but you can't know both at the same time. And that is known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We can't know both things at the same time. Again, neither of those two will be asked of you at all on this class. So let's focus on what you do need to know for this class. We're going to look at Dalton's atomic theory as the basis for the structures that we will study. First, we know that each element is made up of tiny individual particles called atoms. Those atoms are indivisible. They cannot be created or destroyed. We now know that those atoms are divisible and they are made up of subatomic particles. And yet the atoms are the most basic unit of something we call matter. There are subatomic particles, but they are not going to be composed in the same way. For any single atom, they must have those protons, neutrons, and electrons to become an atom. In that theory, we were also told that the atoms cannot be created or destroyed.
and that is correct, except in nuclear reactors and in the sun or stars. In his theory, he said that all of the atoms are identical in every respect. We now know that that is not exactly true, and we'll discuss that in a moment. The atoms of one element are different from the atoms of any other element. Each element has something that makes it different from the others. And we know that the atoms of one element may combine with the atoms of another element to, in small whole number ratios to form new chemical compounds. In order to continue studying this portion, we'll need to know what those subatomic particles are and how we write them and symbolize them. So we'll start with the proton. We know that a proton has the symbol P plus. It will have a charge of plus one, a mass of one AMU, and it is found in the nucleus. So we need to define what an AMU is. An AMU is an atomic mass unit. That is how much one proton or neutron weighs, and it is used to give us a number that we can actually utilize at the atomic scale. So let's go on to the neutron. Neutron has the symbol N, zero. It has a charge of zero, no charge. Its mass is approximately one AMU, very close to the mass of the proton. There is a very small difference, but we're gonna just say it's one AMU for those two. It is also found in the nucleus. And finally, we have the electrons. The electron symbol is a little lowercase e with a negative charge on it. It does have a charge of negative one. It has a mass of about one two hundredth of a AMU, which means it's really, really tiny. This location is found circling around the outside of the nucleus in something called the electron cloud. We're going to look at the nuclear structure. The nuclear structure tells us that the nucleus contains all of the protons and the neutrons of the atom. Therefore, the mass of the nucleus is essentially equal to the mass of the atom. That is because the electrons are one two hundredth of an AMU and we discount them. On the other hand, when we look at the radius of the nucleus, we see that it is extremely small compared to the radius of the atom. To get an idea of the size, the nucleus might be the size of a ping pong ball, whereas the radius of the atom is probably the size of a football stadium, if the nucleus is a ping pong ball. What that tells us is that the mass of the atom is determined by the number of protons and the neutrons, but the size is determined by the space that the electrons occupy. And finally, we have atomic number. By definition, an atomic number is equal to the number of protons in the nucleus. It is only the protons, and it is the way that we identify the element that you're speaking of. This is what we can identify an element with that is called the atomic number. So if I told you that I have an element with atomic number of 15, you would immediately be able to know that I have 15 protons and that my element is phosphorus. Or if I told you that I had the element iodine, I could look at it and know that it has 53 protons because its atomic number is 53. It would also tell me that there are 53 electrons because in the neutral atom, the protons and the electrons have to be equal to keep the charge the same. And just as a reminder, you do not have to memorize the atomic numbers. You will be given a periodic table that will have the element symbols and the atomic numbers on them. You will also have another number on them, but for now, you just need to know the atomic number. So again, what we know so far, protons and neutrons are found in the center of the atom, something called the nucleus. They give us the total mass of the atom. The electrons are found orbiting around the outside, going in random patterns in certain areas with high probability in certain zones that we call shells.